keynote speaker today is an extraordinary gentleman by the name of Navneet Chug. He also is a member of the Thai Global Board. And I also have a nice boring bio that I'll read to you, but I was very privileged to be at lunch with Navneet Chug along with some of the board members and some of the finalists. And he's an extraordinary person who talked about his own personal journey, both in law and in pro bono work, and of course with Thai. And I hope he'll share some of that personal journey with you tonight, um, and particularly the episode of feeding homemade uh, gajar halva, which is really carrot. It's diabetes in a square. It's carrot with sugar, I think, with some butter in case you have cardiovascular disease, so that, you know, it's kind of that. Uh, to the uh, Prime Minister of India, I think that's a really great story that you should share. Uh, Mr. Chug is the classic overachiever. He is uh, a lawyer. He is a certified public accountant, a certified financial planner. He is the first president of, a, of another organization I belong to, which is the North American South Asian Bar Association, also called NASAVA. He's a co-founder of Thai Southern California, or Thai LA, if you want to call it. He's the founder of the South Asian Bar Association of Southern California, the Indian Professionals Toastmasters Club, the International Indian Bar Association. He's also chairman of the board of Premier, Premier Media Inc., a publishing company out of LA, California. His law firm supports, with its pro bono work, 50 charities. And he told me that he made a decision, and his firm made a decision, not to turn down any charity that had a legitimate request for help. It is an extraordinary example for those of us who are lawyers or accountants or other service providers to try to follow. He's on the board of the Asia Society of Southern California, the Habib American Bank, Ignify, an IT consulting firm, and Pratham Southern California and American India Foundation, which is really a foundation that raises funds for charitable activities. And he's got a great story about that, too. The Chug firm was started by Navneet Chug in 1985. It offers both legal and accounting services. It has 10 international offices, including five in India, and employs over 250 professionals. As I told you before, he's a member of the Global Board of Trustees of Thai, and he is an extraordinary raconteur, passionate about Thai and the journey of entrepreneurship and its importance. And I am distinctly privileged to welcome Mr. Chuk to the podium. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Okay, be honest with me. Uh, I was told that I said to Suresh, I said, Suresh, how come there's a lot of people here? I thought it was going to be a small gathering. What did you do? He says we promoted it really well. We told everyone Kim Kardashian is coming. <laughs> so honestly clap if you'd rather Kim Kardashian be here than me. There's a few honest people in town. <laughs> it's OK. I don't like you either. <laughs> and not only I don't like you, 315 million Americans don't like you either. <laughs> and as you all know, that it's not what it used to be. Canada is not what it used to be. I used to come here, and it was party time. You'd give $100, you'd get 130 140 120 Yesterday, for 500 American dollars, I was given 400 and some change, Canadian. So I said, this isn't right. So I went outside and asked the cabbie how much to Delta Hotel. He said, $58. I said, I'll just walk. So I, since, since I've come all the way from Los Angeles, I thought you should know why we don't like you. Because it's an emancipated audience, right? All educated, so you can handle the truth. So here's why we don't like you. You have more land than us. 
you have a better economy than the United States. You have health care for everyone. You have less people living below the poverty line than in the United States. One out of 12 in Canada, one out of seven in the United States. Can you believe that? The richest country on the planet, 30% of the world's wealth, and one out of seven people live below the poverty line. You know what the population is of eight of your lesser populated 13 provinces? Three million. That's the number of prisoners in United States prisons. <laughs> You put 0.1% of your population in prison. We put 1% of our population in prison. The murder rate in the United States is three times that of Canada. You have a better housing market. You have more natural resources that we're jealous about. And don't be too happy. Don't forget what the United States did to Iraq when we found out that Iraq has <laughs> a lot of oil. Weapons of ma massive destruction, right? You know what the weapons of massive destruction we finally found? The U.S. budget deficit. That's the... <laughs> and this, according to several people I talked to today, and my experience of coming to Canada maybe the 15th time in the last 30 years, I have to admit that you have better looking women in Canada than the United States. <laughs> I figured I didn't bring, bring Kim Kardashian, the least I can do is say that. <laughs> and this I personally don't like, and I'm going to end my speech today with this line, uh, and I'll remind you. This I don't like at all, and this is true by the way. You in Canada live longer than the people in the United States. You knew that, right? Two to three years longer. And finally, you guys have a queen. We have Sarah Palin. <laughs> so, congratulations to all of you for, for being in Thai or helping Thai. It's a great organization, one of the largest networking organizations in the world, 57 chapters around the world, about 20,000 members, about 2,500 charter members. These are senior people with gray hair and more money so we can charge them more membership dues. But the interesting thing to talk about with you is why are you here in Canada? How did you get here? And what are you doing in life? And what is your purpose? So let's start with 250,000 years ago in Africa when the first child was born, the modern human being. It took 175,000 years for human beings to reach South Asia. And it took 235,000 years for human beings to reach Canada. Now, that's too many years to think about, right? 75,000. So let's fast forward to just 500 years ago, the year 1500. You know what's the richest country in the world? You know what's the highest GDP country in the world in the year 1500? Let me give you a hint. Our friend Christopher Columbus was headed there. If you need proof that was India the number one richest country in the world with the highest GDP, I have proof Christopher Columbus was headed there. He wasn't headed to the United States or Canada. 25% of the world's wealth and GDP, India. What about year 1600, just 400 years ago? The richest country in the planet, 25% of the world GDP. India, 1700, India, 1750, India. And by India, I'm assuming you know I mean South Asia. And what was United States and Canada's GDP in the year 1700, or 1500 and 1600? George Bush's great, great, great grandfathers, right? That's all that was there. Zero, literally zero. In the year 1500, 1600, 1700, population of the United States when we India when U.S. got independence in 1776, less than four million. Now, fast forward to 2000. Guess what India's portion of the GDP of the world is? 
2.5% from 25, a 90% drop in 250 years. And US in those 250 years goes to 27% and Canada at three. What happened? Well, that's for another day what happened, but here's where we are now, in summary. Population of South Asia, 1.4 billion people, 20% of the world, one out of five people in the world is from either India or Pakistan or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh. 65,000 kids are born every day. Can you imagine? One every two seconds. That's 20 million kids every year. So India and South Asia add a Canada every 18 months. And you think you guys are getting crowded. <laughs> so the government of India wasn't happy about this. They, say, they said, let's commission a study of what's going on in this country. So they go to a populous state, Uttar Pradesh, the most populous state in India, 100 million population. And they spend a lot of money and they do commission a study as to why in one village the population was really high. So they do a study and then the results come out. And here's the results. Well, it turns out that at 3.30 a.m. every morning, a long, big, huge goods train passes through the village and wakes up everyone. So 650 million people in South Asia are under the age of 25. I told this Uttar Pradesh story of this train passing by to, uh, to a non-Indian friend of mine, and he says, no, it can't be, you're not telling me the truth. And I said, of course I'm not. He says, it's probably because of the new drug via Agra. But I said, I don't. I don't know about that, but so here's, here's a shocking number for you. So the Indian diaspora, Indians outside of India or South Asians outside of South Asia is 40 million people. The largest diaspora in the world is the Chinese, about 60 million living outside of China. So 40 million South Asians live outside of South Asia. Can you believe this, that the annual income of this 40 million people is equal to the annual income of the 1.4 billion people in South Asia? 40 million kids right now in South Asia don't go to school, and 500 million people in South Asia out of the 1.4 billion are not literate. So I thought I'd shock you guys, because I know you all believe that there's justice in God's world, right? It's delayed, but there is justice. So one fine day, an accountant or somebody in God's country is gonna wake up and say, well, this doesn't seem right, that there's so many people in South Asia, and we need to fix it. So there's gonna be a study in God's country, heaven or hell, wherever he lives or she lives, I don't know. Uh, and the study is going to come out with this bad statistic for all of you. And the statistic is that one of the most densely populated countries in the world is India, 900 million people per square mile. And you know what the number is in Canada, right? Nine. So the report is going to say that, God, if you want to fix this really in an instant, then let's just equalize Canada and India. And I did very quick math. India is 1.3 million square miles, one third the size of Canada. Canada is 3.9 million square miles. You add the two, that's 5.2. So you distribute the 1.2 billion people of India accordingly, and it's a three to one ratio. So 900 million Indians are gonna be moved to Canada. <laughs> so where's Diana? there. So I told Diana this afternoon and she says, Navneet, my street looks like that right now. <laughs> but things are getting better, millimeter every day, 
400,000 engineering graduates a year from South Asia, 85,000 MBAs every year, middle class of 360 million people growing at 15 million a year, 420 of Fortune 500 are already in South Asia. The middle class is growing. For instance, uh, 1 billion cell phones, by the way. The population is 1.4 billion, 1 billion cell phones. To just give you an example, IBM, for instance, I'm sure there's an IBMer in, in the room. IBM, for instance, has 450,000 employees. Largest number of employees anywhere in the world, India, with over 100,000 employees. So, Martin Luther King said that the life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And given that all of you are in this room related to Thai, part of Thai, and entrepreneurship and creation of wealth, this is a relevant question for us that Martin Luther King posed. What are we doing for others? How can we help? So I'll tell you how you can help. But first, look at where God placed you in Canada. And with great difficulty, by the way. Do you know, and you know, all of you know, Canada has one of the largest concentration of South Asians anywhere in the world outside of South Asia. Almost 5% of the country Diana, on your street it's somehow 25%, but 5% of the country, one out of 20 people in Canada now is a South Asian. And these Indians and South Asians in 1907 were told by the government of Canada that you cannot vote in this country. And in 1907 we were told, or our ancestors were told, that Canada is going to establish a quota system for you Indians, only a hundred per year. And there are several hundred of you in this room today. Hundred per year. Guess how long that lasted? For 50 years. Hundred Indians per year. In 1957, the government of Canada came to its census and said, okay, we're going to change the number from hundred to three hundred per year. And of course, thanks to the point system, thanks to which many of you are in this room today, now 25, 30,000 South Asians come to Canada every year. So now that you've arrived in Canada with difficulty and doing well, I have more bad news for you. More and more burden of the world is going to be placed on Canada and specifically on you. Why? Because the US's preeminent position in this world is on a decline, on a relative decline, and will continue to decline for at least another 100 years. At the end of the day, there has to be justice in this world, right? 5% of the world lives in the United States and enjoys 30% of the world's wealth. If you count up all of the television and all the jewelry and all of the assets in every single home in the world, and the value of the home and the Mercedes and everything else, it's $688 trillion. 200 of that in the United States. Well, it is changing, right in front of us. It is changing. 10 million people unemployed in the United States. The unemployment compensation bill to United States is $10 billion a month. Afghanistan and Iraq cost another $10 billion a month to United States. And we've ended up with $15 trillion in debt. $4 trillion just because we were looking for some weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And to add to all the bad news, Warren Buffett now has cancer. <laughs> so what can you do? Well, I was speaking in front of uh, a student's crowd at UCLA one day, and it was a mixed audience, and one Indian kid stands up and says, what should be my purpose in life? And I said, well, good question. I guess you're born for a reason and to figure out a purpose in life and nobody can ever figure it out. And just about when it's close to being, you figure it out, you die the next day. But I said to him, I said, I know what your purpose in life is. Tomorrow morning, when you, when you get up and you're brushing your teeth, look in the mirror and God will tell you what your purpose in life is. And he says, what do you mean? 
I said, first of all, you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to see that your skin is brown. And why did your parents come all the way from India to United States to give birth to you and your skin color is still brown and maybe God's telling you something and maybe you should look at why you're so blessed and what the color brown is telling you that maybe you should do something with India and why not? India is going to surpass, India's GDP is going to surpass that of the United States in 2043, another 31 years. India's GDP is going to be higher than that of the United States. Significant wealth is going to be created in South Asia in the next 30 years. Is there anything better for you to tell your kids to do? I tell my kids, my 17-year-old son and 14-year-old daughter, that I came to America 31 years ago, but I, when I die, I'm sorry, I'm gonna leave you in Mexico. <laughs> so, you can help create a better bridge, a stronger bridge between Canada and South Asia, and that's one of the purposes of Thai. And you can export our ideals to them. That probably is something more important than anything else we can do in life. Hernando de Soto, the famous Peruvian economist who wrote a book, Why the Capitalism Worked in United States and Failed Everywhere Else in the World, and he says that two things that we take for granted in US and Canada. It's a nightmare in the rest of the world. Opening up a company and owning a stock and having the stock in your name and buying a house and having the deed in your name is a piece of cake in US and Canada and is a disaster to do in the rest of the world. So we all know that at the end of the day, the only purpose in life is to leave this world a better place than how you found it. And I told you that you guys live longer and I'm not happy about that and I'm going through midlife and I, my wife says, let's go for a health checkup because I was complaining about something. So she sets up an appointment with a doctor, uh, Dr. Singh, who am I know. All of you have a Dr. Singh in your life, I know. <laughs> so I called up Baldev, my friend. I said, listen, we're coming for a checkup. And uh, can you help me? Like, can you say nice things about me and tell my wife to be nice to me and not complain about all the Thai work I do? And he says, what do you want me to tell her? I said, why don't you tell her? Ritu is my wife. I said, why don't you tell her that Navneet has a serious disease and he's going to die? And if you want to save him, there's a few things you can do. <laughs> Fair enough, right? And Baldev's a nice young guy. And so he says, what do you want me to tell her? I said, tell her to make a nice breakfast for me and a nice dinner for me when I come home in the evening, if I come home. And... <laughs> and uh, don't ask me to do chores on the weekend and don't complain about Thai work and don't complain that I work too much and don't give me household chores to do and tell her that she should be intimate with me every night of the week for 10 months otherwise I'm gonna die and, and don't spend too much on shopping and don't bug me to go to malls on the weekend I have a deal with my wife I go to the mall with her every birthday her every birthday so Baldev says, you know, Navni, this is all wrong for me to do. I said, yeah, we're just playing around. I just want to see where I stand and how loyal she is to me. And it'd be a nice thing to find out in middle life, right? So he says, okay, fine, we'll do it. So we go to the doctor and we do a checkup and Baldev and I are playing Teen Pati over there and not really doing any checkup. And we... We drive, we get into the car and we're driving back home. And I said, so Ritu, what did Baldev say? And Ritu says, Navneet, you're going to die. <laughs> Nina, thank you so much. <laughs>